uh, only a gardener, growing food organically. Uh, I started off as an organic gardener before becoming uh, a commercial producer for about 10 years. Then I retired to pursue a different career while still um, continuing to grow all our own food organically. Uh, I write a blog for gardeners, also write for the Irish Garden magazine, and enjoy experimenting with new ways of growing things for gardeners. Um, this um, quote here, uh, I, uh, I hope you can see it. Can you all see it? Uh, sorry, okay. Um, it says, human welfare is fundamentally li linked with Mother Earth, not just because the soil is the primary source of most of our food, but because it occupies a key position in the rhythmic cycle of life itself. Um, and we've heard a lot about that this morning. Um, this is from a very treasured collection of old Soil Association uh, magazines. Um, so we'll start with the first, first one here. Um, this is the totally degraded soil that I started with um, where we live now in 1982. Um, it had been in tillage for about 15 years uh, and was totally exhausted. There was no life in it at all. Not even weeds would grow on it. It was so bad. Uh, by then, I'd been growing for about seven years. Uh, my um, first child was born with a lot of allergies and I had to learn how to grow organic food very quickly. Um, so I read everything I could on organic gardening, uh, particularly the books of Lawrence Hills and um, Old Soil Association magazines uh, like this. Now this picture shows the evolution of my soil very clearly uh, to what it is now. There's a lump of the dead, lifeless soil that's so dense you can almost build houses from it. I'm um, sitting on my soil now, um, over 30 years later. Um, it's now fertile and full of life. This is the early beginnings uh, of my raised deep beds. Um, some people call them no-dig beds now. That's the sort of latest catchphrase. Um, but they're, they're essentially, they weren't really dug. Um, you just mulched and you added compost. Uh, here, I started off by throwing all the soil up on the paths um, and making a, a, a giving more depth and drainage to grow things. Um, there were some very miserable crops the first year. Um, I sowed into pockets of compost because I hadn't been able to make enough compost to actually spread it everywhere. So I concentrated it where I was actually growing the crops. Uh, these were later mulched. Um, this is my first year's produce that year, 1983. I'm very proudly displayed on my kitchen table. Uh, and it was a, a really good feeling. This was my dream to have my five acres and hopefully uh, self-sufficiency. These are early summer crops um, the following year, um, sort of about May probably, um, because there's irises flowering there. Uh, that's 1984. And here's a group uh, of my organic box scheme customers. I started the first organic box scheme um, in Dublin, I think, as far as I know, and supplied uh, the Dublin food crop, and I can see one or two uh, members that I remember from years ago, I won't say old members, um, because they're the same age as me, probably. Um, <laughs> and also um, some of the Fingal Greens. Um, and I, I was talking about organic soil management. Uh, this again is summer of 1984. Um, you may possibly just recognise on my left there our future Green Minister for Horticulture, um, Trevor Sargent. Trevor and I were actually founders of the Fingal Greens. Now here's nicely fertile, uh, no dig is the, the new phrase for them, deep beds in the late 1980s. Somebody's phone is ringing. <laughs> um, Anyway, this uh, actually, um, sorry, yeah, these are nicely fertile, um, no dig raised beds in the like, late 1980s, as I say. Um, at this stage, you can see the soil is actually much darker, it's more fertile, there's a lot more light in it. Um, in this article from the same old Soil Association mag that I quoted from at the beginning, um, you can see that there's really nothing new. There's interplanting with legumes, selfish, uh, surface mulching, uh, composting, cover crops, and no digging on dry soils. Um, this is an alternative way to actually make a uh, raised bed, which is uh, quite useful if you don't want to go to the expense of having uh, nice wooden sides. Uh, I think it's called a hugel culture bed. Um, I think Klaus will probably correct me on that, is that right? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Uh, permaculture people are very big fans of this. Uh, basically, you, you 
just heap up all your rubbish, your, your sort of prunings and, and wooden bits and pieces uh, in the bottom, uh, and then you heap soil on top, uh, and you later mulch with uh, lots of uh, grass uh, clippings. And it actually breaks down quite nicely and produces very nice soil in a couple of years. This is my productive kitchen garden now with higher level raised beds because I now uh, have quite a lot of back problems uh, from years of organic gardening. But the soil is so lovely in those beds now that you don't need tools at all. I can just plant with my fingers and yet um, there's so much humus uh, um, plant material in there that it's very moisture protective. Now, so how did I do this? How did I affect this transformation in, in really dead soil? Well, first of all, I started making compost, lots of compost. Um, and here uh, is a sort of fairly well organized compost bin, layers of all sorts of uh, different material, well mixed. Uh, and the layers are added before it's recovered. And the reason why you recover it is that if you don't, you get this steam rising from it. Um, and this is, is uh, you know, pretty hot. You could fry eggs on these compost heaps. Uh, but the steam rising from, from compost heaps are actually emitting greenhouse gases. If you keep the heaps covered, um, they actually condense and drop back into the soil. Uh, so it's really vital to cover compost heaps as well as soil. Don't leave compost heaps uncovered um, in, the, in the winter. Uh, here's another useful small-scale um, uh, livestock, uh, hens. Uh, they're very useful for actually um, revving up compost heaps, a uh, little bit of uh, nitrogen in their droppings. Uh, they're great compost activators, of course, um, and pest controllers uh, anywhere around the garden. And most small gardens could probably uh, accommodate a small little arrangement like this with, with a run that's moved every couple of days. Um, and also, they produce the most wonderful eggs, of course, on, um, and they're fed with organic hen food. Um, this is the end result of the compost. Well rotted, five star, two year old compost, full of plant foods and humus very sweet smelling. I mean, I just can't, I'm a compost sniffer, I have to admit it. Um, and I, I can't stop, so I just love sniffing the compost. <laughs> and, and it's just almost edible, you know, you just wish you could eat it really, it's wonderful. I wish it work sometimes. Um, <laughs> composting is it, another way, uh, sorry, compost, uh, composting another way. Um, this is using only shredded woody prunings, leaves uh, and grass clippings. Um, it's already breaking down nicely. Um, and uh, becoming inhabited with fungi and uh, microrhiza and, and all sorts of other um, little things. Um, and actually it's, it's been shown um, to detoxify soils. Woody prunings, when they're composting, uh, can actually start to detoxify soils, which is a very interesting um, avenue, which I think don't think anyone spoke about this evening, uh, this morning, I mean, but it, it's, it's a really useful way of using up stuff. Um, now here, yeah, worm Posting is, is actually another really good uh, alternative. If you don't want or don't have room for a very big uh, composting area, vermicompost, as it's known, is much richer uh, than other materials, um, uh, and particularly much richer than the materials the worms uh, actually ate, uh, the soil and plant materials. They can actually be incredibly up to 10 times higher in potash uh, and um, about seven times higher, I think, in, in, in um, phosphates, uh, nitrogen, magnesium. So worms really do the most incredible work, uh, as Matthew Jeff mentioned this morning. I, you can't have a good soil without worms because they're working way underground all the time. This is my homemade worm hotel. Um, it's a third of the price of commercially available ones and at least twice the size. It's very easy, you just want a bit of drainage in the bottom, a few holes, a wire divider in the middle, so you throw a whole load of, um, you put some bedding material in like the, the wood chips and um, leaf mold stuff I showed earlier. Um, then you just rip up newspaper, all your household waste, uh, apart from um, meat or dairy, which you must put in there because worms don't like fat. Um, but it works really well. Another thing I do is a lot of green manure. Um, these are the lovely flowers of crimson clover, much loved by bees, so they're useful two ways. Um, and their roots actually fix, uh, as uh, Klaus mentioned earlier, that they're really very important uh, nitrogen fixer, very important for the fertility of the garden. The roots go down a very long way, and you can just see uh, the little white, pinky white nodules on the roots forming there. Uh, and those are the sort of bacteria that actually form these nodules on the roots. Now, this is uh, red clover actually just after sowing. 
I tend to grow it um, between tomato plants quite a lot in my polytunnel um, because studies, uh, recent studies have actually shown that growing legumes between tomatoes actually attracts all sorts of good bacteria to their roots uh, and actually makes them a lot healthier. And I have to say I do find it works very well. Um, you can also sow after planting the tomatoes later on. It's a little bit more difficult because you have to avoid the tomatoes. And here um, they've actually just been covered with fleece to protect the, the, the emerging seedlings um, so they don't get burnt in the sun uh, before they uh, are up. Here's another great green manure for growing before tomatoes. It's a mustard called caliente, a specific type of mustard. Um, and what happens is when you chop it down and dig it into the soil, it releases a gas called isothiocyanate, uh, which is a natural biofumigant and actually kills soil pathogens. So it's a very good one to grow if you grow tomatoes too often in the same soil. Now, you really shouldn't grow tomatoes more often than four, uh, once every four years in the same soil, because otherwise you get a, a build-up of pathogens in the soil. It's another great green manure, which is also very useful for bees. That's for sale, which is very pretty. Uh, borage is also incredibly useful. It has very deep tap roots, uh, which bring magnesium up from low down in the soil profile, which means it's also very nutritious for us, us to eat, um, and it's delicious too. Claytonia is one of my favourites. Um, not very often known as a green manure, but if you grow it once, you'll have it forever. Uh, a lot of people think it's a nuisance, but I absolutely adore it. It's a wonderful salad vegetable. It drives the worms nuts. It's like crack cocaine for worms. It absolutely <laughs> uh, I had a lovely experience once weaving late at night in the, in the tunnel, um, and I, got, I felt incredibly privileged because as I was weeding, just before the torchlight actually, um, the worm spotted the torchlight, I saw a worm reaching for a little bit of Claytonia and pulling it back down into its burrow. It was the most magical experience. I just wish I could have videoed it or something. But it was so wonderful to see that actually happening. Because most people are like, yeah, you're know, just falling down, don't really do very much, do they? But actually, they're working away all the time. And I think they're, they really are the most magical creatures. Um, Claytonia also makes a, a great cover crop. And of course, you don't have to sow it, as I said earlier. If you've grown it once and let it seed, it comes up everywhere. Um, but it's brilliant because it's holding on to nutrients, it's covering the soil, it's protecting the surface, uh, which is really very important. It also holds on to moisture. I also grow uh, sort of cover crops um, of sort of uh, beneficial um, insect attracting plants too, herbs and flowers, all around my fruit trees because that, uh, it attracts pollinators uh, and it's also, um, of course, protecting the soil again. Even in large containers, um, now when I grow containers, I grow quite a lot of things like figs and grapes, etc., in large containers. And I always mix quite a lot of soil uh, with organic um, peat-free potting compost, and that works really, really well. Um, and I, I sow, or don't even have to sow, uh, perennial like clover, in, which is in a lot of our ground, naturally. Um, and uh, it's actually a very good way, again, of attracting pollinators um, and actually uh, covering, uh, protecting the soil. Um, and here is just some very really colourful oriental salads with self-sown uh, cover crop again, Claytonia. Um, great for holding on to nutrients again and can be hoed off very easily if it becomes a nuisance. Here's a very good example of what happens if you don't cover your soil or your compost seed. And this is what you could be losing if you leave it bare over, if you leave ground bare over the winter. Now this is two-year-old compost stirred into water. When settled, it shows heavy organic solids at the bottom lighter material at the top, and water with a lot of soluble nutrients in, in the middle. This is why soil should always be covered uh, in the winter, uh, actually all the time. Uh, it doesn't even matter if it's covered with weeds, but cover it with soil. <coughs> That's really important. Another way of uh, improving soil is actually growing a diversity of plants. Um, as Matthew mentioned earlier, Difficult plants, uh, different, sorry, plants attract different bacterial communities to their roots. Um, here's a picture of my first polytunnel, and this is back in some early to mid 80s, um, showing intercropping uh, of onions with uh, lettuce. It's also called catch cropping, and I got it arranged into four different rotations. So I've got three rotations down in the middle, again in a deep bed, which is actually never dark or really or walked on, uh, and the side beds were also um, fourth part of the rotation. Uh, and here's the new um, uh, kitchen garden, the, the new raised beds, uh, which again are, are very fertile now. Um, and, and this is uh, another 
uh, thing you could do. Uh, again, uh, diversity of plants. Uh, growing, uh, this is sort of intercropping, uh, growing beneficial um, insect attracting plants. Uh, they're edible flowers. Um, and uh, this works actually very well. Um, and here is a tomato called um, Indigo Rose. Uh, and we've sort of got several, I mean, it all looks very hectic, but actually it works. I don't get disease, I never see pests. Uh, and this is the way nature does it. Nature doesn't just grow great long sweeps of one particular crop. Nature grows lots of things together. And I spent a lot of time observing nature. And whatever the latest fad is, I really don't follow it, because I just do what I think nature is actually um, going to do. Uh, here's some more examples of intercropping, catch cropping, green manure, and at the same time as tomatoes. I grow lots of herbs and flowers in my tunnel, and it's full of very happy buzzing bees uh, all summer. And this is diversity in the lawn, which most people don't think about, but actually it's really important. Um, an awful lot of chemicals are used just for the sake of having just grubs on lawns, which is absolutely disastrous. Um, incredibly toxic, very bad for the soil. Uh, well, uh, you know, and actually in the summer they go dry, so then they're pouring water onto them. Uh, and if you ha if you grow clover, um, they're green all year round. <laughs> You've got lovely green lawns. There's plantains growing in there, which actually have um, lots of uh, uh, fungi and, and microbes around the roots as well. And it's a very good diverse community. And, and you know, if you actually mow them, then they just flower a bit lower down. It, they're not bothered in the least. Again, here's more lovely what people call weeds. Um, going in a very dry lawn and very dry summer, but they're very happy and looking very pretty actually. The bees enjoy them very much. Um, here's another thing I, I do. Um, it's, it's actually, sorry, I lost my way here. Um, green uh, mulching uh, a lot. I use a lot of um, lawn clippings, for, grass clippings for mulching because I have a lot of them. And it works very well because they sort of knit together and form a tight surface uh, after a couple of weeks. Uh, they're nicely brown and they're no problems. Uh, here's potatoes. I have a strange way of growing potatoes early in pots uh, and then planting them um, later uh, when they're actually big enough to, to hold the root balls, big enough to hold together. Uh, this actually gives me potatoes very early. They, they actually have a crop up much earlier underneath them. Uh, it's very good for the soil. They're mulched afterwards. I never have to touch them again. I barely have to water. I don't have to weed. And here are some very happy worms, um, nicely pink. I was hoping that after here and happy was saying you shouldn't have grey worms. <laughs> Looking nicely pink and rosy and healthy. Um, and this is literally within a couple of hours of, of putting a, a, a mulch of grass clippings on the soil and they're there already. Now, this is a very good example of what not to do to soil and sadly what happens to a lot of uh, people's soil when they're moving into new houses. This was actually a new tunnel being put up um, behind our yard, uh, I think it's 2009 possibly, um, in the wettest July in living memory. Um, the, the, the contractors said they couldn't possibly come any other day, they couldn't put it off for a couple of weeks because they were so busy, it was still the end of the Celtic time. And I had piled all the topsoil nicely in one corner so that they wouldn't um, ruin it, but they insisted on spreading it all again because they said they couldn't get their levels unless everything was done that way. And, uh, they were going down towards and go, so I had no choice. I wanted my new tunnel and I needed it. So basically, they went back and forth over the soil in a, a lovely um, earth moving machine and concreted the posts in. And here we are the following spring. At this stage, I had a dislocated shoulder. <coughs> I've got a concrete moonscape in my lovely new tunnel. So a friend came along and said, Well, I'll sure I'll break up the surface. With, uh, you know, my little digger. Well, actually, that little digger could barely even get through the surface. That soil was like concrete. Um, and it was rearing up, literally, trying to dig up the clods of soil. But having spent so long learning about how to improve soil, um, actually, I was quite pleased with the way quickly, um, again, I started off again like I did 30 years before, just adding pockets of really well uh, rotted compost to the bits in the soil where I actually wanted to plant. You can see how appalling the rest of it was. Um, this is the following spring. Uh, by planting that way, I've actually uh, put planks in to make the new raised beds, which I never walked on, um, and added a little bit of compost where I could, mulched, uh, and the crops aren't looking too bad. This is, uh, I think, 2012, um, that's a few years later. 
incredibly fertile already. Um, and it, it really works. So this is um, 2014, um, just a couple of years ago now, and lovely, healthy crops. Uh, you know, I grow it all year round, particularly winter crops. It's very useful. Um, and the, the soil is just wonderful. Um, you know, the worms in there are happy. Uh, it's wonderful to see worms everywhere you dig. They're just wiggling and they're lively, and it's fantastic. So, what I would like to sort of end with is a quote from Rachel Carson, who wrote a wonderful book called Silent Spring, which I'm sure most of you have probably read. Um, she was credited really with starting the environmental movement in the uh, the 1960s, about 1962, I think it was published. Uh, sadly, uh, can you read that? Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, not enough people listen to her warnings. The lure of easier chemical farming and cheap fossil fuels was far too strong. We had it all then, didn't we? And like irresponsible teenagers, we squandered the riches of Mother Earth to the point where in many places, it can no longer do the job that it evolved to do, which is to support healthy life on this planet. But like teenagers, we now have to grow up, prove our maturity, as Rachel Carson said, and take responsibility for our actions. In the autumn of 1992, after the first Rio Earth Summit, I organized a lecture here at the Botanic Gardens, which was given by Alan Gear, the then head of the HDRA, or Garden Organic, as it's now known. His warning was again stark. We ignore the value of soil at our peril. Um, and I think all of us who were there actually went home re-energised and determined to do what we could to help raise awareness of how valuable soil is in mitigating climate change too, not just growing in the future. Few people wanted to listen, and at times it seemed uh, like a hopeless task. We fast forward fit over 50 years since Rachel Carson's dire warnings, and these words from the esteemed soil scientist Ratan Lau give us renewed hope that we can do something to avoid catastrophe, and that the answer to doing that really does lie in the soil, to use the old expression, but only in a healthy, living soil. We have no time to lose. Whether we are farmers, gardeners, or consumers, we have to recognize that we have a responsibility, all of us, to restore soils. Only regenerative organic agriculture can do that, and it is the only key to a healthy future. The soil that gave us life and nurtured us holds the key to our past. And the evidence of many past civilizations who didn't heed the warning signs of impending disaster. That soil also holds the key to the future of life on this planet. And that key is now in our hands.